The subject of this video is the SN2 alkylation of enolates. And I want to lead right off from the beginning with a cautionary note about overusing this reaction. Be wary of using this reaction inappropriately. When you see it, a light bulb is going to go off, and you're going to realize that you can use enolates as nucleophiles in SN2 reactions, just like cyanide, OR-, SR-, and all the other SN2 nucleophiles that you saw in Organic Chemistry 1. But you have to be very, very careful with enolates because there are often multiple isomeric enolates that can form when a base is around if the alpha carbons are different. And there's always the possibility of elimination as opposed to substitution. And that's a big problem with enolates because they are pretty strong Bronsted bases if we're talking about alkyl halides as comparison. So you got to watch out for alternative, for side reactions, for getting the enolate that you want and all that good stuff when using this reaction. And we'll look at synthetic approaches that avoid all these issues. And I encourage you to use those as much as possible when you want to alkylate alpha to a carbonyl as opposed to doing a basic enolate alkylation. It'll work in basic cases, and we'll see some of those very simple situations in this video, but it doesn't work well in general. And a lot of work historically went into getting around some of the problems that we'll encounter in this video with the alkylation of enolates. Now that said, enolates are nucleophiles at carbon. And so one thing that we may think of pretty quickly is, what about an alkyl halide electrophile? Could I do an SN2 reaction, for example, with benzyl bromide to create a carbon-carbon bond between the alpha carbon of a ketone and that benzylic carbon of benzyl bromide? bromide? And the answer is yes, we can. However, only methyl or primary alkyl halides will work in this reaction. Secondary and tertiary alkyl halides will undergo elimination in the presence of enolates. They're just too Bronsted basic. They'll rip a proton right off, kick off the leaving group, and you've got yourself a carbon-carbon double bond. So watch out for elimination here with secondary and tertiary alkyl halides. If you've got a primary alkyl halide, though, and you've got a ketone or aldehyde without any sort of enolate regiochemistry issue with two equivalent alpha carbons or only one alpha carbon or one set of alpha hydrogens, then you can treat with a base like LDA. This generates the enolate quantitatively and then treat with the reactive alkyl halide, something like benzyl bromide or methyl bromide is, is best. And via an SN2 elementary step, you get alkylation of the enolate formation of a new carbon-carbon bond. So that's quite nice. But this is about as far as this reaction goes. And the first question that comes up is, what if I use a starting ketone in which two isomeric enolates are possible? So let's say we now have a cyclohexanone with a substituent linked to one of the alpha carbons so that this alpha carbon on the right with one alpha hydrogen is very different from the alpha carbon on the left, which has two alpha hydrogens. What's going on here? Well, now we could end up with two isomeric enolates. We could deprotonate on the left to generate the enolate um, with the double bond on the left, like so, or we could deprotonate the right-hand alpha carbon to generate an isomeric, constitutionally isomeric enolate with the double bond on the right. One thing to notice about these double bonds is this is a less substituted double bond, only three substituents, O minus this guy and this guy, and the bottom enolate is more substituted, tetrasubstituted, one, two, three, Four. So there's a difference in substitution pattern here, and we know from earlier conversations about enols, and the same applies to enolates, that the more substituted enolate is more stable. That's why this is lower in energy than this. The more stable enolate is what's known as the thermodynamic enolate. But in this case, it's actually not the one that's formed more quickly. The less thermodynamically stable enolate is formed more quickly because the less substituted alpha carbon is more accessible, right? There's less steric crowding around that alpha carbon. And so um, it forms more rapidly. And when, an, when a very, very strong base like LDA is used, deprotonation will occur selectively here since once we get over that hump, over that deprotonating hump, there's no going back. That said, 
for all the reasons we just mentioned, the more substituted enolate is more stable. So under conditions when deprotonation is reversible using a base like alkoxide or hydroxide, we tend to get more of the more substituted enolate. Now in that case, conversion to the enolate happens to a small degree and that creates problems. That actually creates an entirely different set of reactions called aldol reactions that we'll talk about a little bit later in the course. So using alkoxide bases in this context is very problematic not to mention alkoxide or hydroxide engaging with this, which is something you're already aware of. The SN2 reaction between OH- and benzyl bromide is something you've almost certainly seen before. So here, although we do have ways to generate the thermodynamic enolate, alkylating thermodynamic enolates with the SN2 reaction is, is generally profoundly problematic. The point really for this slide for the time being is that the less substituted enolate forms more quickly, the more substituted enolate is more thermodynamically stable. And this is a general finding for ketones with two alpha carbons with different substitution patterns. We touched on this a bit on the last slide, but this slide really hammers home how to selectively generate the kinetic enolate or the thermodynamic enolate. What reaction conditions to use to get ideally quantitative or close to quantitative, close to 100% yield, of our desired enolate. The kinetic enolate, I think, is a bit easier to understand. We just use LDA, which is a strong, very strong base, to quantitatively generate the less substituted enolate. One advantage of LDA is that it's actually rather sterically hindered around the basic nitrogen. I want to back up and look at the structure of LDA here. The two isopropyl groups create a good bit of steric hindrance, uh, steric crowding around the basic nitrogen atom, and this tends to bias that nitrogen to go for the less sterically crowded hydrogen in the ketone substrate. This is one reason it goes for the less substituted position selectively here. And so we get the less substituted enolate in 100% yield because this is an extremely favorable uh, proton transfer process. And then when we treat with the alkyl halide, we'll notice that reaction occurs at the less substituted position selectively. So that enolate just snaps right onto the electrophilic carbon of benzyl bromide, and we get substitution at that less substituted position. Generating the thermodynamic enolate is a little bit trickier. We cannot use alkoxide or hydroxide base. That'll just react with the alkyl halide in an SN2 reaction, right? Then we'll end up with an ether that's not going to do the job for us. Instead, we have to be a little bit clever here and realize that, okay, if I use a strong base, like sodium hydride, but I don't use a full equivalent, say I only use 98% or so of what I need, that leaves a little bit of ketone unreacted. And so while I generate the less substituted kinetic enolate at first, because there's some reactant left behind, equilibration will occur. If I give it enough time and I keep it at room temperature, which is a very high temperature in, in enolate world, you can take my word for it that room temperature 20 degrees C is quite hot for an enolate, we're going to rapidly equilibrate to the more substituted enolate. So there will be a little bit of that unreacted ketone still left behind, but the vast majority will be ultimately be converted into the more substituted enolate, and then you can hit with the alkyl halide, and substitution will occur at the more substituted position. So this is taking advantage of equilibration by only conver converting a portion, only 98% of the starting ketone is converted to enolate, and this allows equilibration through the neutral ketone to occur. And I would caution you against using this too much or worrying about this too much. The acetoacetic ester synthesis is a perfectly interchangeable approach with this for substituting at the more substituted position. It takes advantage of what I call pKa biasing, making the pKa at this alpha carbon much, much lower than the pKa over here is another way to selectively substitute at the more substituted position. 